Professor Roberta Mock from the University of Plymouth, and she's going to be talking about sustainability. It's not gone live yet. It's going live oh, now. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Marketplace session. Our speaker in this session is going to be Professor Roberta Mock, who will be talking about sustainable materials in the creative industries. And I'm going to hand straight over to Roberta. We'd like as many questions as possible, so please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll come to those at the end of Roberta's presentation. Over to you, Roberta. Thank you. Am I up now? Can I be seen? You're good to go, Roberta. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Roberta Mock. I'm Professor of Performance Studies at the University of Plymouth. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to a project that I'm part of and that we're right in the middle of. It's called Sustainable Materials in the Creative Industries, or SMICI for short, and it's been funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And it's a 12 month project. We're almost exactly halfway through. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce the project. And at the end, we have time for your feedback and your input into the project as well. So it's probably important to note that this isn't um, a traditional research project. It's actually a scoping study. And what we're doing is effectively conducting a sweeping survey with the aim of informing HRC funding policy and also governmental policy. So in short, what we're trying to do is benchmark state of the art practice and perceptions around material sustainability. We're supposed to identify existing trends and showcase cutting edge developments as well as flagging sector-wide and discipline-specific barriers that have to be negotiated and addressed in order to achieve widespread, sustainably-oriented practice. And so with this in mind, we have two key aims to the project, and you can read those on the slide. First is to scope current and imminent sustainable practice around the sourcing, use, disposal, recycling, and reuse of materials across the creative industries in the UK. And the second is to identify discipline-specific perceptions of the expectations and issues that relate to that sustainable practice, again, across all of the creative industries in the UK. And as an example of those uh, issues, obviously what we can see in the picture um, is pointing to the problems arising from excess production and also matters relating to waste processing system. And while these problems are common across the creative industries, each sector and subsector is developing slightly different responses to fairly fundamental questions such as what do we actually mean by recycling? How much material value is retained in recycled materials and products? And not only that, but those responses are constantly shifting as well. So the main outcome of our project has two parts. And uh, one part is we're going to make overarching observations and recommendations, connecting the various industries and drawing out commonalities where appropriate. Um, so as this image points to uh, sustainable aspirations within almost all of the creative industries are challenged by lack of recycling facilities that are appropriate. And we're working on 14 separate disciplinary reports to capture how all of these different fields are responding to shared problems in transitioning to net zero and which aspects are specific or unique to those disciplines. Our project team comprises an administrator, two advisors, including Jeffrey Crossick, who was director of the HRC's Cultural Values Project and is also chair of the Crafts Council. We have one principal investigator who I'm going to introduce you to in a moment and three co-investigators, including myself. So what I'm going to do now is introduce you to the specific role of the PI and the co-eyes. And basically we're responsible for different disciplines and producing these specific reports for each discipline. And then we're co-authoring the general report altogether. So this is our co, uh, our principal investigator, Peter Oakley, who is based at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, 
he is responsible for six disciplines more than the others and more than the rest of us. And when you look at this list, architectural design, applied arts, design, fine art, museum, galleries, and heritage. And he also has responsibility for um, an overview of general uh, digital uh, equipment that are specific and used in the creative industries. And you can really get a sense of the extent and the diversity of the industries that we are investigating together. Of course, what becomes immediately apparent in all areas is the way that the creative industries are linked to much, much wider ecologies and economies. So, for instance, as we can see in this image, the total logging of virgin forests is directly connected to product and exhibition design, to furniture making, and also set construction in the theatre industry. One of the barriers to sustainable practice is industry convention. So, for instance, traditioning to net zero involves overcoming conventions of expectation, such as in this image, the use of traditional pigments in painting or in conservation, ceramics and glass. There are also conventions of practice, such as the use of supposedly disposable nitrile gloves in museum practice. And there are also conventions of excess. And here we see it in the image in relation to model making in architectural studio practice. Still, um, something that Peter has identified is a current prevalent focus on improving the sustainability of processes that involve plastics in their designs. And this crosses interior design, design for medical applications, and especially, of course, packaging design and e-waste. And there is also a crossover here with plastic fibers that are used in fashion and textiles. Um, I think that this particular focus seems to be so prevalent due to the high profile plastic pollution um, media campaigns, such as those that are fostered by our colleagues at the University of Plymouth, the so-called Blue Planet effect. Um, and this means that plastics in particular are being met by multiple industry associations, by UKRI itself, and also um, various academic research centre in interventions too. The flip side to the sort of conventions I've been identifying is actually compliance. And in some ways, compliance um, is kind of a, a productive convention as well. So for instance, and pointing um, to the image on this slide, especially related to jewelry and digital equipment, in the gold industry, there are now voluntary and required sustainable and ethical standards. And I'm, I'm going to return to those uh, settings of standard a bit later in relation to my own area of practice, which is theater and performance. But also for um, commercial sectors in the applied arts, again, such as the jewelry sector, there is a noted shift to using the UN's sustainable development goals as a means of framing their interventions into sustainability. So, um, so far, Smicky has determined that this is less evident in studio-based practices than in um, sort of commercial environments. I'm going to move on to my fellow co-investigators next. This is Ita Jensen, who works at the Edinburgh College of Art, and her areas are film and photography. So thinking about Ita's disciplinary areas and returning to the idea of convention, there are certainly very productive ones to harness in transitioning to more sustainable future practices. For instance, conventions of frugality or conventions of shared economies, such as, for instance, the use of film sets set equipment um, set hires. So it's normal to hire uh, film sets and equipment. And this is Jules Finley from the University of Brighton, and she's working on fashion, textiles, and accessories. And these are all creative industries criticized, as we all know, for their unsustainable use of water, land, fossil fuels, and energy, as well as toxic chemicals, waste pollution and also unethical labor practices. So that actually crosses across a number of the UN's um, sustainable development goals. Now, Jules has confirmed um, so far on her work on the project that there is actually very wide industry and production awareness in waste and sustainability. And there's also a very widespread desire to do the right thing. 
So there's charities like RAP, for instance, that are offering grants and resources to establish circ a circular textiles economy and counter the, quote, take, make, dispose, unquote, model of production and consumption. So this image uh, represents the death of the Aral Sea between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, which dried up about 10 years ago due to watershed extraction to irrigate cotton fields. Um, and that was 10 years ago. And Jules has noted that although awareness is really high and it's been around for years, there actually hasn't been that much change in the past decade in terms of the industry. The fashional, Fashion Ethical Report of 2019 highlights and grades companies and brands usage in terms of water waste, ethics, sustainability, and a 2021 Business of Fashion Report covers the same issues. Still, there are reasons to be optimistic as well, including changes to production and real attempts to find solutions related to climate change and also now COVID-19. So this is an image of a fabric made from waste pineapple fiber um, and points to the use, the increasing use of secondary agricultural product um, for alternative textile sources. So now we get to my own disciplinary areas, which is the performing arts. Uh, that's me performing there. And I'm working on three interconnected disciplinary reports. So theatre, which I'm taking to mean building based, that's regardless of genre, so it doesn't have to be straight theatre, production and also performance. And under performance, I'm looking at people, touring and thematics and content. So the theatre and performance research community is actually and has been extremely interested in responses to climate crisis. Next month, for instance, there is a five day long conference being run by the International Federation of Theatre Research. It's their annual conference in Galway in Ireland, and it has the theme of theatre ecologies, environment, sustainability and politics. So that's a five day event actually focusing on those issues. However, this issue tends to be focused on thematic content and the messaging of productions. It focuses on environmental sustainability or else um, it deals with like applied performance practices that raise awareness and aim to change behavior rather more than uh, the practice, the production processes, the materials in production. So even though a professor of theatre at York University in Toronto proposed a sustainable theatre practice treaty based on Antarctic treaty system back in 2015, there actually is very little activity or research that's currently bringing together form and content and um, also production processes. And this is actually, there is um, a couple exceptions to that. One is a burgeoning interest in Indigenous practices and methods, and there is also some modelling of performance training and pedagogies that take into account this as well. So during a two-day online conference in April on Shakespeare and climate crisis um, organized by the Globe Theatre, actually only one of the examples of sustainable Shakespearean production, um, there was only three actual examples of sustainable production. The rest of the two days was really looking about sensitivities and eco-criticism um, within Shakespearean's text itself. But one of the examples is this, the Handlebards. So the Handlebards are a Shakespearean company that tours the UK by bicycle and they draw attention to green modes of transport and the importance of locality as well and their website if you look at their website it says simply we travel by bike because we care about the planet and we want to promote sustainability and healthy living. So the handlebards have two troops of actors one female and one male and they travel around and they do Shakespeare. Um, a book by Evelyn O'Malley last year called Weathering Shakespeare notes that they tend to be more attentive to modes of production than to the uh, enactment of eco-critical readings of Shakespeare's plays, unlike a lot of other examples I've seen. But what they do really do is draw attention to weather and our places in it by working within rather than trying to harness the ecology of place. And the Handlebards have won uh, a number of awards, including the 2014 Award for Sustainable Practice at the Edinburgh Fringe, and they were also nominated for The Stage. So The Stage is the uh, industry newspaper in the UK. They were nominated for their 2017 Sustainability Award. And the reason I mention this is 
the fact that such awards exist actually indicate the extent to which sustainability is seemingly valued and celebrated in the theater industry. Now, if academic research doesn't focus on sustainable theatre production and materials, then there is a huge amount of activity in the UK, Europe, Australia and North America right now that's arising from and carried out through industry professional associations, often in partnerships and consortium. So recent examples just from the past three months include the launch of Perform Europe, which is an 18-month European project that involves five pro partners, and that's testing sustainable touring practices. We see the launch of the EcoStage website, which includes sustainable production guidelines. And there has also been a survey uh, which has been commissioned by Greater London Authority on the development of reuse and recycling facilities for London theatre, so sharing assets. Uh, this is an image of the Willow Globe in Wales, and that's a one-third size living version of the Globe Theatre in London. Um, this is actually a small-scale and intimate response to climate crisis, and I think it's really worth pointing out that the theatre industry is absolutely vast and diverse. It includes commercial venues, receiving theatres, SMEs, theatre and education, small-scale touring companies, subsidised producing houses, and everything in between. And everything is what um, the aim for the Theatre Green Book. So the Theatre Green Book was published just March this year um, in its beta version. And you can download it for free online. This is just volume one and it focuses on sustainable production. And volumes two and three will focus on buildings and operations and they're due to be published in the autumn. But the point about the Theatre Green Book is it's supposed to cover all of the different types of theatre and performance um, making across the UK at the current time, all of those different scales and typology. So the Green Book consulted hundreds of industry professionals to draw together current best practice in sustainable theatre making. It has the backing of all the major theatre and sustainability bodies and organisation, and importantly, it sets out for the first time voluntary steered sta tiered standards for achieving change. Um, so there's a baseline, there's an intermediate, and there's an advanced level that can be aimed for. The National Theatre, National Theatre of Scotland and National Theatre of Wales within the past two weeks have committed to making all of their shows from now on to Green Book standards. And this is quite a big deal. So at the moment, the National Theatre, the average National Theatre uh, production is able to reuse or recycle about 43% of the materials it disposes of following a production. And the baseline standard to which they are aiming from now on is going to be 50%. So we can see already um, an incremental change from committing to this. Hopefully they'll be able to achieve it. And this rather blurry image represents the key principles. It's a, it's a large book. Um, and this is the materials hierarchy in it. Everything is in a truly sustainable show will have a previous life. Everything will be used again. And this creates a circular economy of theater making and theater production. So I've been attending a lot of seminars and talking um, across the sector as much as possible. And some of the key matters that are re related uh, to sustainability in the performing arts that are arising, especially in relation to the Green Book um, and people who want to commit to the Green Book are these. And these are just a couple of them. Um, the first thing is that's brought up all the time is the need for effective carbon calculators for the theater industry. Because although some are being tested, they don't really exist yet. And and questions about whether materials inv inventories are really a sufficient mechanism to replace that. Uh, there's a lot of talk about carbon offsetting and the, the fallacy of offsetting. There's a lot of discussion about the importance of carbon literacy training for entire production teams because what happens or has tended to happen is that one person on a production team has been responsible for sustainability and really it needs to be owned from start to finish in order to instigate change. Uh, a lot of people are very worried um, and dealing with the compound impact of both COVID and Brexit, which has frankly just left the industry in an extremely fragile and precarious position. Um, it's only just opening up. There are still theatres that have not resumed uh, production yet, and this really impacts on sustainable aspirations. 
There's also a lot of discussion about the need to build bridges between the construction industry and the art sector um, to, to have economies of scale, for instance. And there are a lot of worries about timber. Um, so, so working with the construction industry um, on uh, ecologies and economies of scale um, related to timber, which we know is in great demand and is likely to triple in the next couple of years. Um, and also there are great difficulties in finding solutions for touring um, because unlike the handlebars who travel um, on bicycles, when you are talking about large-scale touring like is being indicated in this image. This is an image of um, Birmingham Royal Ballet. It's a picture from their 2017 fleet bus. Um, they had 10 articulated lorries uh, going from town to town for their 2017 production of Cinderella with sceneries, props, lighting regs, rails of costumes, um, wigs, etc. And their PR actually said that this fleet, quote, harnesses the equivalent power of 4,000 horses. So, um, so there's a lot of work to be done, even, even if people aren't flying um, to their tour dates, there's a lot uh, of work to be done on touring with the big companies. And here we are. This is my final slide, which is my invitation to you. And this is really why I wanted um, wanted to come today and do this presentation to tell you what, what we're working on, but also ask for your input. So if you are a creative practitioner or someone who is working in the creative or cultural industries, we really do want to know what are the most significant sustainability issues for you? What are your barriers? What are your challenges? Um, we would like to know if anybody has examples of excellent or innovative practices, especially about the sustainable use of materials that we should follow up. We'd love to know that. If you're a consumer or an audience member, we'd also be interested in knowing your main concerns related to sustainability. Uh, Smicky has ethical approval. If you put anything in the comments or say them today, um, I might use them, but they'll be anonymized. And also, if you think of anything after this presentation, please email me. My email address is there, and it's also um, easily accessible online through the conference pages. Thank you very much. I can't actually hear anybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roberta. Um, sorry, I seem to vanish. Um, if the audience has some questions, um, please put them into the Q&A. And while you're doing that, if I may kick off, um, I was just thinking about the content of, uh, you know, it's normal to see, you know, people driving petrol engine cars or eating meat, having a barbecue or whatever on TV or theatre or film. To what extent should art be sort of mimicking life or leading life towards a more sustainable future? Hmm. Well, um, my personal opinion is art is the place that we imagine radical futures. So art is art is where we both model and practice a better society. Sometimes we have to do that by, uh, by performing our challenges and our barriers and performing what's wrong. But ultimately, art is a, is a space of radical uh, community building and, mm -hmm. and imagination. And um, that's, that's always been my starting point. There are all sorts of different types of art, though, um, and they all serve different purposes. So that that segues nicely into um, the first question. Given that importance of the arts, um, given its their potential to lead the way, um, and their importance for our well-being, you know, our sort of creative needs. Do we need to calculate um, carbon use in a different way from how we do with other industries? Wow. So that's a that's a that's an interesting question because I kind of I've 
interpret it as, uh, do we give the arts a free pass in a way? <laughs> That's kind of how I'm reading it. Is is there a kind of art offsetting um, that we, we kind of say, oh, well, you don't have to be completely sustainable because you're doing good things in other ways. Um, I might, apologies if I got that wrong, because I can't see the questions, I'm just hearing them. Uh, I would say absolutely not, <laughs> that arts must exist in the real world. And um, we must be aiming for net zero in all of our practices and um, in art and in life and in business. And of course, those all meld together. So no, uh, if, if I understood the question correctly, my feeling is is quite strong that um, that the arts must be subject to absolutely the same um, requirements to to model and work towards a, a better planet um, in light of climate crisis. Thank you. I've got another um, comment from um, one of the listeners who represents Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. I don't know if they're ones that you've contacted it during your project. Um, they're exploring the use of agricultural byproducts and feedstocks to incorporate into elements of the bioeconomy, such as bioplastics. Um, and there's a link there that will be archived um, for how to contact them. That's absolutely brilliant. I'd love to know um, a bit more about which which of the creative industries they're supplying to, and who is really uh, who's really taking up th these these uh, innovations. That would be really wonderful to know. Thank you. Just checking if there are any other questions coming in. Does anybody have um, any other questions that they'd like to ask? I think that, oh, no, I've got a yes. So the first question um, came back saying, surely art should be carbon exempt. Um, you said that you disagree. I'm wondering if they would like to put their point of view um, into a question. I would actually, um, I would love to know that question, but I would also like to know whether this, the person who's posing the question is a creative practitioner themselves and so are they making a claim that their art making should be um, exempt because to be honest I haven't encountered a single artist who has claimed that so I'd be really interested in knowing that mm -hmm. um, although if you are a consumer or an audience member it is also interesting to know whether you what you're saying is it doesn't matter to you um, if artists are you know, uh, have a huge carbon footprint or not. So I'd like to know which, uh, whether whether you're speaking as an artist or as a as an audience member. Oh, I'm a scientist. Okay, um, are scientists audience members then? <laughs> or I suppose one one issue is that if the arts can say, you know, they are central to human well-being, therefore they have a different carbon economy from that that everybody else has to abide by. Other industries can say the same. You know, medicine doesn't need to upgrade its practices because it's essential to human well-being or agriculture because you know farmers are feeding us and we wouldn't be alive without them doing that so i'd say it's very hard to make an exception for one industry and the arts have the advantage that they can kind of broadcast publicize what they're doing and hopefully lead the way mm, yeah i mean i think um, I think it's really it's important to say that the arts are an industry. The arts are a business. Mm. Um, we, there te it tends to be forgotten that you know artists aren't like happily working in garrets for free places. We we are talking about a very large economic sector that is linked in to every aspect, every other aspect of the economy as well. Um, I would ask where you draw the line of who is exempt um, from working towards a net zero future and um, 
why why should why should they be but what i would say is is i'm i'm finding this a really fascinating question because it actually is not something that was ever questioned you know in setting out this project the project is set on the assumption that absolutely the creative industries are wholly responsible for working towards net zero um so that's interesting thank you good different question um and this better be our, our last one before we wrap up. What role can geoethics play in the creative industry? Geoethics. Ah. Well, I think the the first thing that comes to mind is quite simply that just as I was saying that the cultural industries are linked to all other aspects of our society um, and economy, the cultural industries are actually a network that, that spreads out globally. You know, uh, international touring is a big thing. <laughs> um, we, it is not just, it is not local, um, although, the there are many issues that are shared there is no doubt that even and especially in the cultural industries the actions that we take in the global north significantly impact on the global south um so just like what i would say is just like any industry we live in a in a, a connected world um and we have to behave ethically um in every possible way um again in relation to this particular project um i haven't heard an awful lot so far in my field in in theater uh, and performing arts focusing on geoethics but what i do know is especially in um peter and jules areas so uh issues related particularly to textiles and mining geoethics um are right at the top of of their agendas so it's one of those things about when when you look at the different disciplinary sectors uh different priorities emerge so the the practitioners that I have so far been in contact with have not raised that at the top of their agenda, but that has been um, a priority in some of the other uh, disciplines in the creative industries. Thank you. That's a really, really good point to end on. Thank you very much for being our speaker today, Roberta, and thank you to the audience for joining in and um, contributing your questions and comments. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie.